Sup, chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, for the past 30 years or so, hair loss sufferers have been very fortunate to have access to two clinically proven, FDA-approved drugs in the forms of finasteride and topical minoxidil. It's hard to imagine that three decades after finasteride hit the market as Proscar, we still haven't seen anything else released that is superior, and frankly, that isn't too big of a deal. Because after all, finasteride even by itself will work to stop and reverse hair loss in the vast majority of people who use it. Combined with minoxidil, the treatment is even more effective. Fortunately, while hair loss research does progress at a glacial pace, it isn't completely stagnant, which is why there are many exciting pharmaceutical treatments in development, such as the WNT Wind Pathway Stimulators, as well as the Kintor Pharmaceutical Antiandrogens like pyrolutamide, and even drugs like GT20029, which seeks to degrade the androgen receptor altogether. And I have made videos on all these promising treatments and I'll link them below in case you haven't seen them yet. So there are many great pharmaceuticals that are on the horizon which will give hair loss sufferers even more options and possibly serve as viable alternatives for the very few people who don't respond well to the present day FDA approved treatments. Sadly though, there is a subset of the population who cannot be persuaded to use pharmaceuticals under any circumstance, no matter how many regulating authorities say the treatment is safe. It really is hard to say when this distrust of pharmaceuticals began in the United States of America, but if I had to take a guess, I think it started with this asshole right here named Kevin Trudeau. If you're over 30 years old, then you're probably old enough to remember seeing this guy on late night infomercials. You see, starting back at around the year 2003 or 2004, there was this infomercial featuring this guy that was set up like a legitimate news interview, similar to what you'd see from something like Larry King. On the show, Kevin Trudeau plucked his book titled, quote, Natural Cures they don't want you to know about, unquote. So by they, he was of course referring to the pharmaceutical industry. On the show, he made the case that there are natural cures for every disease, but the drug companies hide this truth so that you'll buy their drugs instead, which will only provide temporary solutions since it wouldn't be profitable for them to provide any kind of long-term solution. So this is of course complete bullshit. The reason why people usually have to take drugs indefinitely rather than there being a drug that is a quick fix is because most diseases diseases are chronic conditions and are driven by processes outside of our control, like genetics. Even life-threatening diseases like cancer and heart disease have a genetic component to them. So anything short of gene therapy will not provide a long-term cure for most chronic conditions. There are a few exceptions, like antibiotics and antiviral drugs, since they are treating acute infections, but these drugs were all developed by the pharmaceutical companies, and the reason they are used instead of natural treatments is because they work much better. And this applies to hair loss too. There is no quick fix because no drug or natural remedy can possibly correct the genetic component behind androgenic alopecia, but a drug like finasteride can halt or reverse the process by suppressing the component responsible for the progression of hair loss in those who have the genes for it, namely the trash hormone DHT. So despite these completely unscientific claims made by Kevin Trudeau, his book nevertheless went on to become a bestseller and his work remained popular even even after he was eventually convicted of fraud and sentenced to prison where he remains to this day. Kevin Trudeau and his book may have faded from public memory, but the rhetoric he promoted lives on as people will make the same points he did in order to gaslight about big pharma and promote bullshit natural alternatives that don't work. Now. I am of course not saying that Big Pharma is perfect, but compared to the supplement industry, which is also known as Big Placebo, at least pharmaceuticals are actually regulated and require extensive clinical testing and review before they can be put on the market. Supplements on the other hand are only regulated as food and not as medications, so the bar is a lot lower for putting supplements on the market than it is for actual medical therapies. But selling supplements can be much more lucrative than simply practicing medicine and prescribing FDA approved drugs, which is why some doctors have quit medicine altogether to become grifting snake oil salesmen fraud cells like Dr. Saladino and Dr. Mercola and many others, unfortunately. So haters of the pharmaceutical industry will often bring up the profit motive of pharmaceuticals, which is immensely hypocritical considering just how profit-driven the supplement industry is, since it is, after all, a multi-billion dollar per year industry, and absolute fraud cell assholes like Dr. Mercola are literally worth hundreds of millions 
millions of dollars since he makes much more money selling worthless crap like collodial silver than he ever could by practicing medicine. But despite all this, many people still believe that so-called natural supplements are somehow safer and more effective than pharmaceuticals. This, of course, is a fallacious argument since nature is completely indifferent to your well-being. In fact, the most lethal substance on the planet is in fact found in nature. It is called botulinum toxin, and the lethal dose is only 1 to 3 nanograms per kilograms of body mass. A nanogram is 1 trillionth of a kilogram, and your average human weighs about 70 kilograms, just to give you some perspective on just how lethal this natural substance is. Sure, there are plenty of other natural substances that are innocuous and some that are even beneficial, but even beneficial natural substances will have side effects because all therapeutic drugs have side effects without exception. And regardless of whether or not they are sourced from natural sources or if they're synthetic, even the plant-based drug aspirin, which is perhaps the oldest drug that is still on the market today, has a long list of side effects, some of them even being life-threatening, such as severe gastrointestinal bleeding, which is why even though it is, it is over-the-counter, long-term therapy with aspirin still requires a doctor's supervision. What I find perhaps the most ironic about hair loss sufferers putting so much faith in nature providing a viable treatment for them, though, is the fact that it is nature itself that is making them go bald to begin with. Androgenic alopecia is a genetic trait that has over over 250 genes associated with it, and people who have the androgenic alopecia trait have a higher composition of androgen receptors, 5-AR activity, and thus more DHT on their scalps compared to people without the androgenic alopecia gene. So, through no fault of your own, Mother Nature has conspired to deprive you of your luscious locks and forever turn you into that guy on Facebook who brings up Jason Statham and Vin Diesel whenever the subject of baldness comes up. So nature is not the answer here. Nature is, in fact, the problem. Despite all this, there are still true believers in natural therapies who are trying in absolute desperation to find whatever connection they can between hair loss and some natural treatment since they don't have the balls to just take the red pill and accept that they're going to need finasteride if they want to stop their hair loss. One of these treatments that is frequently brought up by the sad finasteride-hating bald cell losers on hair loss forums is astaxanthin. Astaxanthin? More like astaxanthin, am I right? Well, all kidding aside, interestingly enough, astaxanthin is in fact an FDA-approved treatment as a food coloring, which probably isn't what you guys were thinking, but I guess that's still better than nothing. Chemically, it's what's called a ketocarotenoid, and the chemical formula looks kind of like a sandworm from Dune. Carotenoids, what they are, well, they are orange-colored, and they are present throughout the orange part of the plant and animal kingdom, ranging from things like pumpkins and carrots, all the way to flamingos and salmon. Astaxanthin specifically is found in algae and in the marine animals that ingest algae like shellfish. Astaxanthin is the reason lobsters turn red during the extremely cruel process when they are boiled alive. However, if you think you are getting astaxanthin by eating shrimp and lobster, you'd be mistaken, because the stuff is concentrated in the shells and exoskeletons, not in the flesh of these poor marine creatures. So if for some reason you want to get used astaxanthin, you might as well just get it directly from its source, which is through algae supplements. So, like many natural supplements, there are all sorts of claims about the beneficial effects of astaxanthin, including anything from curing cancer to preventing wrinkles, and also, like most natural remedies, multiple mechanisms are often invoked as to what it does exactly. And it's been claimed to have effects as an antioxidant, but also an anti-inflammatory, and even supposedly a 5-alpha reductase blocker, which of course is the enzyme that converts testosterone into the trash hormone DHT, which is responsible for androgenic alopecia in people who are genetically prone to it. Given this last effect, people on hair loss subreddits and hair loss forums often bring it up as a natural, safer alternative for because if it's natural, that means it's safe, right? However, if you look at the medical literature, there is a surprising lack of studies looking at astaxanthin specifically to treat hair loss. For example, this 2021 review article of clinical studies of astaxanthin doesn't even mention hair or alopecia at all. However, the agent is apparently a very strong antioxidant, and this review article does find that it might be a promising agent for certain conditions, as seen in this diagram right here. But the authors note that much of the data is contradictory, and quote, there is still a long way to go in order to ensure its effectiveness, unquote. So why is there so much enthusiasm about astaxanthin as a hair loss treatment online? Well, part of it is probably just because most of these people on hair loss forums like to circle jerk over every latest rodent study they could possibly get their hands on. So for instance, I think the enthusiasm for this particular treatment may have started after publication of this 
particular article titled, quote, A Preliminary Investigation of the Enzymatic Inhibition of 5-Alpha Reduction and Growth of Prostatic Carcinoma Cell Line LNC AP FGC by Natural Acesanthin and Saw Palmetto Lipid Extract in Vitro, unquote. So obviously, as the quote just implicated, this is an in vitro study and not a clinical hair study, but the study did look at what astaxanthin does to the conversion of testosterone into DHT using 5 air enzymes from rat liver cells. So yeah, another goddamn overhyped rodent study. But anyways, the author looked not just at astaxanthin, but also at a proprietary combination called AlphaStat, which is a blend of astaxanthin and, and another of uh, natural 5 air inhibitor called Sal Palmetto. Now, Sal Palmetto is another agent which is very frequently claimed to have 5 air blocking activity and which has been used to treat enlarged prostates and androgenic alopecia based on some very weak evidence that I've reviewed in many of my previous videos. But the focus here is on astaxanthin, so let's see what this researcher found out about it. Well, the results supposedly showed an extraordinary inhibition of the 5 air enzyme of 98%. Holy crap, that's even better than dutasteride. The alphastat, which was a combination of astaxanthin and sal palmetto, didn't do so well though, causing only 43% 5 air suppression. But this was 23% better than just saw palmetto alone. The concentration of astaxanthin in the highest strength alpha stat was one third of the concentration of astaxanthin that gave the 98% suppression result. So the author states in the paper that this is the first paper showing that astaxanthin inhibits the 5 AR enzyme, and he states that the combination of astaxanthin plus saw palmetto enhances the effects of saw palmetto on DHT. So you can kind of think of astaxanthin as a treatment which potentiates saw palmetto and makes it a more powerful 5-AR inhibitor. So the author of this study is a fine gentleman by the name of Dr. Mark Anderson, and I think the reason why he was so interested in testing this alpha stat stuff is because Dr. Mark Anderson is actually director of research of Triarco Laboratories, and he owns the patent. So maybe there is some bias here, but putting all that aside for a moment, is it possible that astaxanthin is really a stronger 5-AR inhibitor than even dutasteride? That 98% DHT suppression sure makes it seem so. Well, to better confirm this, it would be nice to get some human evidence of the effect of astaxanthin on the 5 air enzyme, and surprisingly, we actually have it in this article titled, quote, an open-label dose-response study to determine the effect of a dietary supplement on dihydrotestosterone, testosterone, and estradiol levels in healthy males, unquote. Okay, that all sounds interesting, and who knows, maybe this time the article will be free of bias, but no. Wait a minute, the name of this author sounds very familiar to me. Yeah, it's Dr. Anderson again. So this guy just cannot keep his claws off of any research pertaining to the subject of astaxanthin, it seems. He bought a patent to a treatment containing astaxanthin, so you damn well better believe he's going to be involved with the research at every single level, no matter what. So... I'm willing to bet that they're not going to be looking at just astaxanthin here, obviously. I'm sure what we're actually going to be looking at is this alphastat thing that Dr. Mark Anderson has the patent for. And yeah, here it is. It's alphastat yet again. What a big surprise, but oh well. At least it's a human study, I have to say. Dr. Anderson and his friends, what they did is that they enlisted 45 healthy men and divided them into two groups. One group got alphastat, meaning astaxanthin and sal palmetto, at a dose of 800 milligrams per day. The other group got 2,000 milligrams per day of the same stuff. The researchers then measured, measured testosterone, DHT, and estrogen levels before and after two weeks of medication. The goal of the study was not to see if alphastat lowered DHT, rather what the researchers wanted to do was to see if it raised testosterone. So what Dr. Anderson was actually hoping for was that alphastat might be a good treatment for low testosterone, also known as low T. He felt that since most 5AR blockers like finasteride raise testosterone, maybe this drug could do the same thing, but in a more natural way than testosterone replacement therapy, which is interesting, but I can't imagine how he'd figure this could possibly be successful as even powerful 5-air inhibitors like finasteride don't raise testosterone all that much, maybe just 8 to 15% at the very most. Well, Despite this, the results did show that alphastat raised serum testosterone levels a little bit, as you can see in this figure here, which really doesn't bode well for its utility as a therapy for low testosterone, but it does beg the question about whether or not this is a strong enough 5-AR inhibitor to possibly treat hair loss. So, 
DHT was lowered, as you can see here, which is interesting, but the problem was that the maximum reduction of DHT was only a little more than 0.6 nanomoles per liter. Given the baseline DHT in the two groups was between 2.34 and 2.79 nanomoles per liter, this is only about a 25% DHT suppression. Certainly, this wasn't even remotely as close as the 98% suppression as seen in the earlier study with astaxanthin alone, and it wasn't even as high as the 43% suppression with alpha stat. But this type of research is a good example as to why having human data is so damn important since the outcomes can be so dramatically different. This study is yet another example of an in vivo results not correlating with the in vitro experiments. And this is why human studies are so important. Now, you may be thinking to yourself right now, but Kevin, 25% isn't as good as finasteride, but it's got to be better than nothing, right? Well, unfortunately, no. A 25% reduction in serum DHT is pretty much the same as a 0% reduction. And that is because in order for a 5-AR inhibitor to work, it needs to meet a certain threshold in DHT suppression before it has any effect at all. In a study I went over in detail in my video on finasteride dosing, which I'll link below, 0.2 milligrams of finasteride daily was effective in treating antritic alopecia by causing a 61% reduction in serum DHT. However, a dose of 0.01 milligrams daily of finasteride caused only an 11% reduction of DHT. And despite it still suppressing some DHT, it was still no better than placebo at treating hair loss. In another study, it's clear that serum DHT suppression starts to fall off when going from 0.2 milligrams daily down to 0.05 milligrams daily. And so clearly, there is a cutoff somewhere between 11% and 50% DHT suppression where the amount of suppression is is not sufficient to stop hair loss. It's not clear exactly what this cutoff is, but it's likely that it's closer to 50% suppression than 11% suppression, which is why it is very doubtful that a 25% suppression of serum DHT would correlate with any significant improvement in hair growth. This is a problem with natural 5 air blockers, a big problem, and this includes things like reishi mushrooms and saw palmetto, or in this case, of course, astaxanthin. They simply are just not potent enough, even if they share a similar or mechanism to finasteride. They simply don't cause enough DHT suppression to be effective, and it looks like astaxanthin and the combination drug Alphastat are no different in this regard. And if you remember, Alphastat is a combination of saw palmetto and astaxanthin. So even when natural 5 air inhibitors are stacked together, they're still not strong enough to stop hair loss, and certainly not as strong as pharmaceutical grade 5 air inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride. So even if you do get adverse effects from using finasteride at low doses like 0.2 milligrams, which is exceptionally rare, you could still go even lower than that and still have a much more potent 5-air inhibitor than any natural treatment on the market. Even at 0.05 milligrams of oral finasteride daily, this will suppress far more DHT than any natural 5-air inhibitor. So even though it isn't as well researched as higher doses, it is clear that finasteride, even when used at very small doses like 0.2 0.05 milligrams daily is still more potent than any natural 5 air inhibitor that we have on the market, and we know it's potent enough that it will at least meet the threshold where it stops or possibly reverses hair loss in at least some people. So I'd definitely consider microdosing oral finasteride before switching to natural remedies that do not suppress enough DHT to be effective. However, there is one thing I have to stress because I know people have asked me about this many times. When beginning a treatment, you don't want to start from a position of compromise. Start with the standard dose and only adjust your titration if necessary. And remember also that even if you do get side effects, they usually go away on their own. So yes, you should muscle through them for at least a few months before adjusting titration. If you do need to adjust the dose, you can be reassured knowing that finasteride is still effective even at very low doses. Although if possible, I would still try to avoid going below 0.2 milligrams because even though 0.05 milligrams does work, it may not be potent enough for everybody. 0.2 milligrams on the other hand, suppresses only about 8% less DHT than one milligram. So it is still almost as effective and definitely better than any natural garbage that you see on the market. So five AR inhibitors, whether they are natural or synthetic, do seem 
seemed to be an all or nothing type situation. Without sufficient DHT suppression, a 5-air inhibitor really is just as worthless as using nothing. And even if there were some 5-air inhibitor that had a similar potency to finasteride, it would have the exact same side effect profile as well. So there really is no point to this search for an all-natural cure for hair loss, so you might as well just use finasteride since it is much better research, and even though it does have a very small risk of side effects, we know how to effectively mitigate those side effects if they do happen. I'll trust my hair to clinical trials involving thousands of patients over studies using ground-up rat prostates any day of the week. I mean, how can anyone get so excited about a supplement like astaxanthin where there has not ever been one single hair loss study published to this date? There is research on hair loss remedies being done that are genuinely worth getting excited about, but astaxanthin isn't one of them. And with that, it's about time for me to pop my finasteride pill and rest easy knowing that I'll never end up looking like Jason Blaha. So until next time, my fellow hair loss witchers, God bless.